Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from Dublin, from the Republic of Ireland. This is a city and indeed a country deeply suspicious of Britain's Brexit moves, not least because of the implications it has for the peace process and the border between the north of Ireland and here in the Republic. But could there also be a hidden Brexit bonus for this bustling city of Dublin as jobs flock here out of the city of London. I speak to Bertie Ahern, longest serving Taoiseach or Prime Minister of Ireland since Eamon de Valera. This is what he had to say. Bertie Ahern, you're Ireland's second longest serving Taoiseach after Eamon de Valera. You were the Taoiseach who negotiated from the Irish side the, uh, the Good Friday Agreement. How much of a risk is the Brexit process to that crucial agreement that brought peace to Ireland? The whole idea was to try and make um, uh, the island of Ireland one economic unit uh, so that we could move freely uh, without any restrictions, without any regulations whatsoever. The trade uh, was through a frictionless border. Um, which meant, because now there's so many arguments, but at the time it was a, a border that was free of any security, free of any checks, um, free of any passport or regulatory controls of any kind. Then we've had you know, 15 years plus um, of uh, an island that was developing and uh, an island that had economic links and was working perfectly. And uh, unfortunately, Brexit in, in so many ways um, undermines that. And do you think, in a way, that almost two decades of peace, uh, of practical peace, uh, has made uh, key politicians in the UK complacent uh, uh, about the the solidity of the Good Friday Agreement? I mean, does Theresa May or David Davis, even the new Northern Irish Secretary, are they complacent because there's been that period of comparative peace in Ireland? We tried hard in the Brexit debate uh, to get the Irish message over. Um, I went to some of the universities and lectures, but and, 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 and the current, the dead then Taoiseach went over to some debates. But the reality is, Alex, that none of them cared two hoots uh, about Northern Ireland. It was no longer an issue. It wasn't one of the, uh, the, the top three stories as it was for, for generations in, in, in the news. It's as simple or as complicated as this, Alex, that we, we, if uh, the UK pull out uh, of the Customs Union, Forget the single market, we know they're down, forget the EU, but if they pull out of the Customs Union, how can you have a frictionless border? How can you have a border uh, without controls and without checkpoints? As a, a long serving uh, leader of a country, I mean, do you not feel some sympathy for Prime Minister Theresa May? I mean, she's caught between a, a rock, um, that is to say, the, the, the point you make that the Customs Union may be necessary to fulfil the the frictionless border and some very hard cases in the Brexiteers in and out with her cabinet. It's the nightmare for any um, Prime Minister uh, to have a cabinet as divided uh, as hers is. But the difficulty for us, if I can be a bit parochial and just looking at the Irish position, uh, Pascal Lamy, who is the, the expert on world trade because of his WTO, his World Trade Organization days, and his European Commission days, has said, that it is impossible uh, to have um, a non-controlled regulated border uh, if on the Irish border if the UK pull out. That's our that's our dilemma. And um, you know, it, it, I, I love to hear Sir David Davies and all of the others say uh, that they don't want to damage the peace process, they don't want to damage the Good Friday Agreement. Um, they don't want to do anything that will upset the North and the South and all we've done for 20 years. And then quickly add, but we're leaving the European Union, the single market and the customs union. It's not that people will start fighting again or violence, Alex. It's, it's the two-way trade. It's, it's, you know, Ireland is an export country. We export, you know, practically 70, 80% of, of what we produce. And the UK is the big, the big market. But it is the industries that are vulnerable. It is the agricultural industries, it's the perishables, it's, it's the, you know, the, the veg that's picked this morning in, in North County Dublin um, is in the supermarkets tomorrow morning 
um, in, in different parts of the UK. When you look around Europe, I mean, can't you see examples where the uh, one country is in the customs union, one country, let's take Norway and Sweden, for example. Norway's out of the customs union. Sweden, obviously, is a full European Union member and it's in it. Now, that border is it's not frictionless, but it, it couldn't be described as a as a hard border in any real sense, isn't it? It's not beyond the ingenuity of uh, humankind to work out an arrangement. The difference with a lot of the examples that are around, if you take the European ones, is that you know the countries that are outside, they're involved in either the European economic area and they've effectively signed up um, to, to Brussels rules and to uh, freedom of movement and a freedom of movement. So, so there, there's, there's not, you know, there, there might be some technical difficulties, but there's not many. In our case, it's different. Um, the, the, uh, the UK will be out of the whole goddamn lot. Um, and what David Davies liked to mention is the um, American-Canadian border. But um, I don't know why he keeps mentioning that, because it, all you have to do is Google it, and you'll see um, the massive queues um, of traffic um, waiting for the checkpoints. So that's precisely, the example he uses is precisely our fear uh, on the Irish border. In the solution that we would like to find, if somebody does use ingenuity, is as near to the status quo as is humanly possible. Now, Bertie, as Taoiseach, you led coalition governments. So you know the, uh, uh, the difficulties and anxieties of depending on sometimes small parties for your parliamentary yeah, majority. Yeah. And uh, that is the position that Theresa May is in with the Democratic Unionist Party. Uh, and yet their leadership would seem less flexible, less pragmatic than, say, it was 20 years ago. Mm. Uh, were you surprised that they moved uh, against what seemed like an accommodation uh, between Theresa May and the European Union before Christmas? I was surprised in, in the referendum campaign uh, that the Democratic Unionist Party uh, they were the only party, I think, well, the only major party in, in the North um, who canvassed um, for Brexit. Uh, everybody else were, were Remainers. Um, and uh, it was a, a coalition of, of all kind of groups wanted to remain. And, and of course, the vote in Northern Ireland was overwhelmingly to, to remain. Um, so that has to be taken into account. The DUP took an opposing view. They, they believed that they would get a very good deal uh, out of it. So I suppose the election result was, was great for them um, from a political point of view. Uh, it looked at the beginning of the election, Theresa May was going to have a huge majority and that nobody in Northern Ireland would matter at all. Uh, and it ends up in the election uh, that to stay in power that she has to have uh, the support of, of, of the uh, um, relatively small, but you know, for her, very crucial, a group of of, of DUP, uh, Democratic Unionist Party uh, MPs. So I don't blame them for playing the card. I mean, with with their, uh, and I, I don't worry about that because, quite frankly, they have a responsibility now that if if uh, the British government does anything that's very negative, um, and affects the economy in Northern Ireland, who's going to get the blame? Um, in Northern Ireland, it won't be Theresa May, it'll be the Democratic Unionist Party. So um, they can only support her as long as the agreement is positive. And that's not going to be easy as we go through this year. Um, because um, the transition agreement, OK, I don't see that. It's a difficulty. Transition agreement, they probably would go, you want to go to the end of 2020, Theresa May want to go a bit, a bit longer, but she has to watch the next general election when that is. But m more importantly, she has to, to now start working, what's the future relationship? Um, and that's going to be the, cru the crucial issue in Northern Ireland. Looking around the islands, um, both the, the Welsh uh, and Scottish First Ministers are working together to try and secure the position within the single market. Uh, a few any uh, thoughts or advice to these uh, how first ministers how they might deploy their uh, deploy their arguments to get a result. It's in our interest too to to, to watch carefully and in, in the island of Ireland, both north and south, um, how they do and, and what they do because we we, we have built up um, really good relationships, particularly with Scotland o over over the years. Um, 
that's something we want to keep and treasure. There, there's the huge uh, interest between our people and Scottish people. I, I think the big issue for them again is trade. I mean, let, let's look. What is the future relationship about? The, the future relationship is about foreign policy. I think we can see where there can be solutions to those. It's on security. We can see where the solutions are. It's in everybody's interest to have good security. But it's trade is the big one. Uh, and the future relationship, I think, for trade is important for the Republic of Ireland, for the islands of Ireland, for Scotland, for Wales. Um, it's what's going to happen in that um, can have a knock-on effect to, to our population and workforce. Now, under your leadership, the British Irish Council uh, emerged as a, a meaningful institution out of the, the, the agreements in, the, in Northern Ireland. Do you see a, a, a more meaningful role for the British Irish Council, perhaps, looking at this confused Brexit landscape as a means of, of getting that cooperation, which it would be difficult to see any other institution which could bring it about? We all thought forevermore that we were going to be in the European Union together um, and that we would be partners in the European Union and that the negotiating table um, for fisheries and um, you know, for healthcare and cooperation and education was going to be in the European Union. Um, Brexit happens, that's not so anymore. Uh, there is no uh, British representatives at the table on any of these issues, but the issues are still hugely important. So I, I think the British Irish Council uh, will be the only place uh, where, where political leaders uh, of these islands will meet. The institutional arrangement is there. Um, it hasn't been used enough, in my view, um, uh, and I think it should be more active and there should be more engagement. So I, I, I think you're correct. Uh, I, I think it, 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 on the other side of Brexit, it gets a new mm. lease of life. And is it beyond the bounds of possibility that a, a future British Prime Minister, or perhaps even an English Prime Minister, might be phoning up the, the Taoiseach and uh, asking for some subjects to be raised in the European Councils that they're not able to raise themselves? I think the craziest position in the transition period um, is that uh, the European Council will be continuing on. Um, Britain will still be in the European Union fully uh, and they won't have any say whatever at the negotiating table. I mean, it tends to be the worst hand. If you're playing cards, you definitely give up. Um, so I don't think it'll be in the long term. I think it'll be in the short term. Um, the British will need uh, Ireland and, and others um, to be helpful at the negotiating it's table. It's a bit like playing poker with all your cards face up. It's a bad hand. <laughs> Welcome back to Dublin. I'm speaking to Bertie Ahern, the longest serving Taoiseach of Ireland apart from Eamon de Valera, the man who presided over the Celtic Tiger economy of the 1990s. What are the economic implications of Brexit for Ireland? Look at your political career over the period. Isn't there a, a, a silver lining to this Brexit cloud for Ireland? I mean, you were the, the Taoiseach who led Ireland through the, the Celtic Tiger and the, the start of the, the financial sector growing to a substantial size in Ireland. Can't you, you see the gains that are, are possible for Ireland from a, a hard Brexit to, in, in London and in England? Yeah, well, we are gaining already. I mean, in, in, in Dublin, we're, we're not going to take out huge financial houses and see them move on block from, from London to Dublin. That won't happen. But what is happening is that more and more of the financial companies and the insurance companies, aviation, are opening up Dublin offices, are expanding their Dublin office, and that's good for us. We've probably moved in a position where about 1% of our population would have been non-Irish. Now to our working force, about 15% it would be non-Irish or new Irish, whichever term you like to use. It has made a huge difference, and I think if Brexit happens, there will be a gain in, in, in that area. Right across the food sector, which is huge for us, the drink sector, um, and many of the other smaller, small and medium-sized industries, the SME category, uh, they, they will suffer. Um, if there's any kind of tariffs, if there are any kind of obstacles. If you go back 20 years ago, only a third of the trade that took place anywhere else in Europe between Dublin and Belfast was happening. We'd, we'd only a third of the trade. We've grown that now that the two great cities on this island 
are working together, expanding together, developing together. It's not a small figure, uh, a billion a week in two-way trade uh, between, between the, the island of Ireland and, um, and mainly in, into England. It's a, it's a lot of money and before like I know Boris likes to tell us about all the new trade deals, but you know, because there's Boris Johnson, the Boris foreign Johnson, secretary. Foreign secretary he came over here recently. He was talking about the, you know, all the new new deals he's going to get. You should remember, usually when you have a business, you hold on to what you have and then grow it. Um, you, you tend not to throw away what you have and then go somewhere else. And even in the Commonwealth countries, and there's not that many of them that are that big to provide trade, but most of them have agreements already with the EU. So. Um, I don't think that there's this um, great uh, trade deals of the world that are out there. And if, if, if you and I uh, were negotiating tr trade deals and, and you were in India and, and I was the EU trade minister, um, you know, he cannot give the terms um, that the EU can give. I mean, the EU are a far bigger market. Look at your political career over the period. Uh, that despite this huge issue to be dealt with in terms of Brexit, uh, the island and the island of Ireland has developed and been transformed as a, as a serious European player. How, how would you assess that, that period over the, the range of your time in politics? We have over doubled our size of our economy. Uh, in, in the last 20 years. Um, employment, we, when I, I, I was Minister for Labour negotiating with the trade unions, um, we had a million people working um, and we had uh, almost 20% unemployment. Today we have two and a quarter million people working and we have about five point something percent unemployment. Uh, and we wear down, we will, we, we'll go down again, I think, to three and a half or four again. So we're in a strong position. There are ups and downs of that, Alex. You know, a lot of the industries are multinational. A lot of our exports are pharmaceutical, um, IT, uh, um, the food, which is more indigenous. Um, so there, there, there's challenges all the time, but you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a strong country today. It, it said, you know, the, the last thing we need is, you know, problems with our, with our neighbours. We, we, we had that for hundreds of years, so we, we want to try and find solutions to problems and get on with it. And we can do without with the, the Brexit issue. But, you know, we, we are developing all the time, we're strengthening all the time, and we just have to keep doing that and working hard because as a small island, it's, uh, there's nothing ever easy. Bertrand Ahern, in the interest of Celtic solidarity, uh, you get the quake. Uh, the whisky, of course, has to be Scotch. You, you know, Scotch, yeah. None, yeah, none, yeah. Of, this, none of this you, Irish Alex. stuff. Just for you, Alex. But thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. And thank, thank you for very much. Thank you. Fascinating insights there from Ireland's former Taoiseach, Bertie Ahern. So let's hear from you and your tweets, messages and emails. And what a terrific response there was to Maylie McDonald's uh, interview last week. Not least for many women. I'm going to read five tweets. The uh, first five tweets are from some of our women viewers. Fiona Grierson says, well done at Mary Lou, getting Alex Telt, woman, not girl. Those of you who watched last week will remember that Alex referred to Mary Lou as a Dublin girl, and she quite correctly corrected him to say Dublin woman, Alex. Carolyn says, really enjoyed watching this, and I've never said that about a political interview. Hazel says, thanks for today's show. I've enjoyed all your shows, but today explained much about Ireland's political sphere that I didn't know. Looking forward to the next two also. Keep up the good viewing. I'm glad you're enjoying it. I hope you've enjoyed and are enjoying today's show and indeed next week's. Momo says, how refreshing to have interviews where people are allowed to speak without interruption. The new leader of Sinn Féin was impressive and I look forward to seeing what change she may bring. Morag says, there's no denying that the Alex Salmon show is going from strength to strength. Fabulous listening to the new Sinn Féin leader, another strong female voice. And now to give the lads a quick look in, Robert Leckie says, brilliant show again, Alex and Tasmina, Scotland's most global broadcasting ambassadors. You give hope that a voice can be heard. Thanks, Robert. Archie finally says, first time watched the Alex Salmon show. Don't know what all the fuss was all about. It's pretty good. Well, thank you, Archie. And now back to Ireland. Theresa May's surprise election of last year dramatically changed the calculus of the House of Commons. And so tomorrow, I will move a motion in the House of Commons calling for a general election to be held on the 8th of June. Not least for the Democratic Unionist Party. After generation as a mere bit player in Westminster politics, 
The election saw them emerge victorious in their long struggle with the Ulster Unionists for supremacy as the voice of Northern Irish Unionism. Even more significantly, the election result combined with the loss of the Tory majority in the House of Commons saw the DUP propelled into a position of decisive influence in a hung parliament. He who holds the balance holds the power. But with power comes responsibility, and there are signs that this position is causing difficulties within the party. The talks with Sinn Féin have reached deadlock, and the party now seems uncomfortable with the compromises required to restart the devolution process. And no matter how many times we're told that the North isn't British, Northern Ireland is British, and will remain British. The Brexit-supporting DUP now finds its antipathy towards Europe apparently conflicting with its wish to maintain an open border with the Irish Republic. The party founded by the late Reverend Ian Paisley in the 1970s has reached its zenith of power and influence. But ironically, could that very success now be placing all of its achievements at risk? From St Stephen's Green in Dublin to a windswept college green outside the House of Commons, this week has seen deadlock in the talks in Northern Ireland. Uh, and although the, both governments are still in favour of the Belfast Agreement, for the first time in 20 years, voices across the political spectrum from Brexiteers say the Good Friday Agreement has outlived its usefulness. And in the House of Commons chamber, a number of voices seemed less than enthusiastic about the resumption of devolution in Northern Ireland. Uh, I think the people of Northern Ireland will be disappointed in the Secretary of State's statement. Of course they'd like the executive back, but what they want more than anything is a budget yes. and agreement on ways that reform of the health service and education that were all agreed before Sinn Féin walked out. Why is the Secretary of State still dilly-dallying and waiting and waiting and waiting? What actually yeah. does she think is going to be achieved in the next month? Yeah. Mr Speaker, in the last uh, 48 hours, a couple of members of this House and a British MEP have attacked the Good Friday Agreement, as has been said, as failed and unsustainable. Will she join the Tonster, Ireland's Deputy Prime Minister, in condemning such language as irresponsible? The Good Friday Agreement has brought about peace for almost 20 years in Northern Ireland. Could the Foreign Secretary uh, give an unequivocal assurance that the Her Majesty's Government will not do anything that undermines the agreement, including pursuing any policy that not only undermines the agreement or in any way undermines the principles that led up to the creation of that Good Friday Agreement. Mr Speaker, as the House will recognise, this April marks the 20th anniversary of the historic Belfast Agreement. That agreement, along with its successors, has been fundamental in helping Northern Ireland move forward from its violent past to a brighter, more secure future. <laughs> And this government's support for the agreements remains steadfast, as does our commitment to govern for everyone in Northern Ireland. And to the Secretary of State, um, we, of course, as she knows, stand ready to form the executive today, tomorrow, on the basis of no preconditions, on the basis of the agreed programme for government with Sinn Féin back in December, before Sinn Féin walked out and have set preconditions, political demands that they want to see implemented before they get back into the executive. So the fact that there's no executive is not the fault of the DUP, indeed it's not the fault of the other smaller parties either. Let's let, make that very, very clear. But in the absence of devolved government, now is the time for the Secretary of State to act and to do right by all of the people of Northern Ireland. I've just come from a meeting of a group of charities and others who want somebody to lobby a minister to argue with about mental health funding in Northern Ireland. There have been no ministers for 13 months. That cannot continue. It's time, Secretary of State, to set a budget. Let the efforts for devolution continue. Yes, we want to see devolution. But it is a dereliction of duty to continue without a budget, without ministerial decisions. It's time to get on with it. Will the Secretary of State outline the, the timeline for the imposition of direct rule as legislated in this place to ensure that the people of Northern Ireland are not continuing to be led by the nose by Sinn Féin, a party who do not have the interests of Northern Ireland at heart, but who seek only the destruction of the state of Northern Ireland in an attempt to secure an unwanted and unworkable Ireland that is never, never, never going to happen? Jim Shannon, the experienced MP for Strangford, echoing an old war cry from Dr Ian Paisley. However, it was Ian Paisley who led the DUP into government in Northern Ireland with Sinn Féin. In contrast, in a later interview, Jim Shannon sounds pretty uncompromising. 
Yeah, well, I, I think uh, there's three options on the table. Uh, uh, one of them is getting lesser uh, possible by the day, and that's the fact that we could probably get back to an ordinary assembly that works. Well, there's nothing to indicate that that's going to happen at this moment. And the second one is, is direct rule, which will be a clear direct rule from, from here, from London. And the third one, I think, which is a possibility is the halfway house where they reduce the MLA's pay, they reduce their, their office cost allowance, they reduce their, their task and, and they become a consultative uh, uh, body to oversee uh, go government departments in Northern Ireland and the real uh, clout and, and say for, the, for that then goes back to, to the um, direct rule ministers on a Friday at Westminster where they sign off the papers. That's probably where we're looking. This is the second week of our trilogy on Ireland and the wise words of former Taoiseach Bertie Ahern resonate like the ghost of Christmas past for Theresa May's government. This hugely experienced statesman confirms that the Good Friday Agreement is at serious risk from the Westminster government's reckless approach to Brexit. He also envisages the day when Downing Street will have to go cap in hand to Dublin to see its interests protected in Europe, a historic reversal in the relationship between the two islands of Britain. Ministerial statements, Prime Ministerial meetings come and go, but as yet, no breakthrough is in sight. Next week, we return with the voice of former Uchturan of Ireland, Mary McAleese, a woman born in the North who became President of the Republic. She will certainly be worth listening to. So we hope to see you then. So meanwhile, from all of the team here at the Alex Salmon Show, it's goodbye for now.